Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. August of 1998 was a, a big year, a big month for me. That was the month that I started college at Concordia River Forest, Concordia, Chicago. And so it was an, a time of excitement for me, moving from Northeast Ohio, small town Chardon, Ohio, to the big city of Chicago, getting to move on in life uh, to, to the next phase of my life, and starting to, to take classes at, at college. And before classes started, I had two a days, two a days for for football, football camp. And in, in reality, uh, not two a days, three a days. We had three practices a day for a couple weeks, and uh, the the difference between uh, high school and college football quickly became apparent in the middle of three a days, August, Chicago, humidity. I was used to these things in Cleveland, but to go all day from morning till, till sundown, uh, it was exhausting. And I was uh, tired. I was um, given the welcome to college football uh, moments where um, those who were bigger and more experienced than me uh, let me know that uh, I needed to to work out a little bit more. <laughs> and during that time, whew, I was lonely. I remember one point when one of the upper upperclassmen, a uh, 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 guy by the name of Rob Landwehr, he was a tight end on our team, and he came up to me and he said, "You, you doing okay, Larry?" You've got the I-290 look. The I-290 look, I-290, I Interstate 290, was the closest freeway to the school. And so by that, what he meant, the I-290 look was, how do I get out of here and get back home as soon as possible, <laughs> right? He saw, he saw it in me. I felt it, right? Uh, I was certainly not uh, alone during this time, I was with the team, with the coaches, with the school, but my heart was lonesome. And there was one guy in, in particular at first, when I met him, didn't care for him much. He was a freshman like me. He was from Albany, New York. Tough guy, big guy. Played offensive line, same, same position as I did, offensive guard. Seemed to, uh, from my perception by looking at him, have a little bit of a, an attitude in his walk, in the way he talked. He had that, uh, uh, the New York accent, right? And so I just looked at him and was like, I know I don't like that guy, right? <laughs> Until he came up to me. And he said, hey, I, I hear you're going to be a pastor too. Tell me about that. I don't know, we went to lunch, whatever, and started talking. And one thing led to another. Uh, next year, Brian Davies, this is his name, uh, became my roommate. We were roommates for the remainder of college. And uh, appropriately, our dormitory was named David Jonathan. If you know anything about the story of David and Jonathan in the Old Testament, he uh, became to me, I don't know, a David, a Jonathan. I'm not sure who I'm supposed to be in that. But uh, a dear friend, talked to him just a couple weeks ago, and a dear brother in Christ. Moving is tough. Changing your location is hard. It puts strain on our hearts. It makes us feel lonesome at times. And yet... That is exactly the place where Christ and his church can step in and share the love of God and the companionship that only Christ can give. In 
in America, we are in the midst of what's referred to as a loneliness epidemic. And I've heard, I've read multiple books as I prepared for the sermon series. I've read, heard multiple authors talk about it and use that same term, term, the loneliness epidemic of America. And there's so much behind the loneliness epidemic of America, but part of it is moving. One statistic shows that the average American moves 11 times throughout the course of their life. And every time they move, start over. New community, new rhythms, new friends, new neighbors. And it can be hard. And that's America. How much more so? Summit County, right? Like Summit County, where we live, no one's a native. Who's a native of Summit County? Anyone? The closest I know someone, a Jen, our director of Open Arms. Well, yeah, okay, let me qualify. <laughs> Who over 20 is a native of some kind? But Sierra, I love, I love that you raised your hand. Thank you for listening and participating. This is true. And so uh, our director of Open Arms, Jen, she, she was born in Leadville. And that's as close as I know of, uh, as far as a, a native of this area. Technically, that's Lake County, though. So um, <laughs> the, the reality is, is that people here in Summit County, well, we're used to moving. And when we move and we come into this place and our family, having gone through this not too long ago, you need to learn the new uh, rhythms of, the, of this community. And uh, I'll call it for what it is. I love Summit County. But it's different than a metro area. It's different than the suburbs. It's different than what uh, we've been used to. And you know what? I think part of our community might even be a little bit, at first, standoffish. Here's my, this is just Larry's thoughts. Maybe I'm wrong. But because we're so used to seeing people come and go and come and go and come and go that the feeling I got when we first moved here to Summit County was, welcome to the county. We'll see how long they last. <laughs> and so there was kind of that feeling and you had to like earn some street cred before people were really willing to invest in relationships. Not only that, but then there's the whole idea of why, why, why have people moved here to Summit County? Various reasons. The beauty of the place, the skiing, outdoor activities. But there is also an element of escapism in there. People running from former communities, past life, past maybe decisions, that can all feed into the loneliness of our community. And our community leaders are, are well aware of loneliness and, and specifically kind of the mental illness epidemic in our county. There's a, a, a Summit Daily article that I recently I uh, read that it's talking about the lack of mental health resources in our county. So we have a high need for mental health resources and we don't have them available. Did you know that where we live, ski towns in the Rocky Mountains, so figure Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, kind of down that strip, is referred to as the suicide belt. Our rates of suicide far exceed the national average. That's sad. That's scary. Even our sheriff department is well aware of that and well aware of the mental illness epidemic in our county and has completely restructured themselves around this. Back in 2016, they restructured 
around what they refer to as SMART teams, and it's an acronym that stands for something, and I don't remember what. But essentially, when there's a call, when they get a domestic violence call or whatever, they send out an officer with a counselor. And oftentimes, they, they lead with the counselor. Actually, most times, it's the counselor that goes into the home first, wearing a special bracelet. So if something goes sideways, they touch it for two seconds, and the officer's there. I asked uh, a few weeks ago when I, I met with Sheriff Fitzsimons and a couple of his officers, I asked, how many of your calls do you think, percentage-wise, are mental illness related? Without missing a beat, they said, 80 to 90 percent. Mental illness is a reality in our community and people are doing different things. Government, the law enforcement is, is doing d different things to address this reality. But specifically to, today, this morning, I, I'd like to take time to turn to God's word and listen to what God says to his church about the loneliness of our world and the way that the church is called to step into it. Our series that we're going through is called Christmas Feels, right? And, and it's oftentimes during this time of the year, the most wonderful time of the year, that our feelings of mental illness, of anxiety, of depression, of, of loneliness can be exasperated and stand out. And that's why we're talking about this now and talking about the ways that the coming of Christ speaks into our loneliness. Because that's who we celebrate. Emmanuel. God with us. And so let's lean into that. And to do so, I'd like to take some time and look at an individual, a gentleman by the name of Jeremiah. Now for uh, m most of you here know that uh, Jeremiah was a... <laughs> Jeremiah was a prophet, okay? Not a bull for no. Jeremiah was a prophet. <laughs> Sorry, yes, not a, not a bullfrog. What is that? Uh, third dog night or whatever, sing the song, right? Joy to the world. Different, different Jeremiah, right? And Jeremiah was a prophet. He lived in about the 6th century B.C. And his life was filled with loneliness and grief and sorrow and pain and depression. Jeremiah has a book in the Bible named after him. In fact, the longest book of the Bible. And, and the book of Jeremiah is a collection of his writings throughout his lifetime. Kind of like his antho anthology, if you will. And what he saw specifically, the major event that the prophet Jeremiah lived through and spoke God's word into was Babylonian exile. So we have Jeremiah and the Jews living in Israel. They had come there, led by Moses and then Joshua into the promised land. And during the hundreds of years that they were there, they have the, the law and the prophets and they have the Davidic, uh, Davidic monarchy that in, throughout their land. They have their temple they have uh, Jerusalem, where the temple was, and Jerusalem has its city walls. And during Jeremiah's life, what happens is that the Babylonian Empire, they come in, big, rough, tough thugs, and they're bullying Israel. They're not only bullying Israel, but they're invading Israel. And they come into Judah in particular and into Jerusalem and they destroy it. And, and the, the Babylonian tactic, Babylon, just so you know, modern day Iraq, 
is what we're talking about. Their tactic was scorched earth. Burn it down, destroy it, and move the people to Babylon, to our place, to where we live. And so, it is during this that Jeremiah, who not only writes his book called Jeremiah, but the book of Lamentations, we saw, saw the sorrow expressed, the hurt, the longing expressed. Why, O oh Lord, have you allowed this to happen? And here's the worst part. Babylon, led by Nebuchadnezzar, they're rough, they're tough, they're mean, and they're God's agent of destruction. You see, Israel had for many years been warned by the prophets over and over and over, stop abusing the poor. Stop taking advantage of the weak. Stop sinning against me and worshiping other gods. Stop, stop, stop. And when they finally wouldn't, God said, have it your way. And so as Jerusalem is laid in ruins, the temple is flattened, the walls destroyed, the city left bare and naked. Jeremiah, along with the other Israelites, were sorrowful. Many Israelites were shipped over, like I said, to Babylon to live there. And while they were living there, you can only imagine that they were lonesome. They missed home. This was a foreign land, not the land of the Jordan River, but the land of the Tigris and Euphrates River. These are foreign people, worship foreign gods. This is a different way of life. I can't wait to get out of here. And Jeremiah, who at this time was still in Jerusalem, wrote a letter to the exiles in Babylon. That's what we heard in Jeremiah 29. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. What God was saying through the prophet Jeremiah was, um, I know you guys want to come home. It's going to be a while. 70 years is what we know from history. So instead of thinking about coming home, settle in. Establish yourself. And he goes on though, and he, and he tells his people, seek the welfare of the city, of Babylon. Pray for it. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. Because when things are going well in Babylon, things will be going well for you. A bit of a sobering word. But a word of grace and gospel as well. These Israelites who had sinned against God, who had received the punishment of God, were reminded in this letter that God hadn't forgotten them. This was a word from God to them in the midst of a very hard and lonely and grief-filled situation that I am still your God and you are still my people. And it reminds me of the word coming into the world hundreds of years later. The word made flesh. Our Lord Jesus. Not just a, writ a letter telegrammed from heaven, but a person who took on our flesh, who lived amongst us, who experienced the sadness and loneliness of our world. 
who experienced the effects of sin, although he never sinned himself. Who not only acknowledged the sin, but did something about it. Taking our sins upon himself, everywhere that we've ever messed up, thought the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, hurt someone with our words, hurt someone with our actions, Jesus said, I got it. I will take that on for you. I will clean the slate. And he did that on the cross where he takes our sin, suffers our punishment, our exile, our death, and then gives us, who are baptized into his name, his life, his salvation, his forgiveness, his redemption, a communion with each other and community with God. It's like the people of the Old Testament who were exiled to Babylon, we too, through baptism, needed to die first and be brought back to life through resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And live the new life that he provides for us. And so here we are living in, in some economy in, in, in a way, in a sense, we're like the Babylonians. Sometimes some economy, as beautiful as it is, sometimes it feels a little bit more like a, a foreign land than the homeland. Different ways of life, different Ways of relationship, loneliness, lots of snow in May and June. <laughs> and the word that Christ our Lord gives us as we're awaiting his second coming when we will be restored to the promised land, if you will, is very similar to the words that Jeremiah gave the people in Babylon. He tells us, you are the salt of the earth. Now think about salt for a second. Salt sitting in a shaker might make for a good uh, centerpiece on your dining room table or a picture, but good for nothing unless the salt is put on food. You put food or put salt on a, on a steak, you've got a great steak. You put some salt on, hey, even watermelon just a little bit, you're going to bring out the flavors of the watermelon, right? Salt makes vegetables bearable. <laughs> salt is is good. But do you see how salt needs to be in contact with the thing that it's seasoning. You are the salt of the earth, our Lord Jesus tells us. Seek the welfare of the city. Seek the welfare of Summit County. Pray for Summit County. Be in contact with the people of Summit County. Build relationships. Have children and marry and put down roots. Because as things go well with the city, they'll go well for you. Last Tuesday, we had a voters meeting, a congregational meeting as a congregation. And it was a Tuesday night through Zoom. And the topics of the congregational meeting, for those of you who weren't there, were uh, bylaws and budgets. <laughs> no, uh, the two things that I did not go to seminary or become a pastor to do, right? Uh, bylaws and budgets. And, and yeah, we're preparing ourselves, you know, for the, the coming year and for our life together moving forward as a congregation. And going into that meeting, there was some prep, a lot of prep work that had to be done before the meeting, before we could even take bylaws and budget to the congregation. And then the meeting itself was uh, not short. And then um, afterwards, the day after, there was some follow-up items that needed to be tied up. Uh, from the meeting, and generally speaking, I mean, no, not generally speaking, like, it was, a, as far as bylaws and budget meetings go, like, it was, 
an A plus, right? You know, like um, no one went fist to cuffs, right? Like I, there, there are stories of voters meetings and congregations that are far more challenging than what we experienced Tuesday night. So it was a good meeting, but it was tiring. And on Thursday, I was talking to my friend Rick. Rick's a pastor up in Oregon, and just telling him, expressing kind of my feelings of being tired and the long week preparing for the meeting and everything. And he listened, and he said to me, I, I hear you, Larry, and, and I, I'm, I'm with you. I'll pray for you as you're tired. But I also want to encourage you with what else I hear. What I hear is that you have a congregation that is engaged, that cares about the mission to Summit County and how we can reach people with the love of God in this place, that cares about each other and, and, and how we can live life together as a congregation. And, it, and as he was saying this, he goes on and, and expressed, I don't always get that. Sometimes in my congregation and congregational meetings, the, the, the sense I get is apathy. I'm super encouraged that your, your congregation is as engaged as they are. And as I reflected upon his words, I realized, you know, that's what, I guess that's what family on mission looks like. Right? Like, um, no one's going to argue that bylaws and budgets are the most exciting things about uh, a congregation, right? But it is important for the, the family's health as we do mission together, like just like a, a human body uh, has a skeleton, no one looks at a skeleton and says, ooh, look at that attractive skeleton. <laughs> but you need a skeleton so that it can be fleshed out so that the meat can be put on the bone so that you can have hugs and shake hands and smile and look each other in the eye. You know, our congregational meeting, as I thought more about it, it consisted of, of people from all kinds of walks of, of life, right? Uh, you've got members and associate members. You've got uh, nurses and teachers. You've got uh, uh, finance advisors. You've got uh, people who are paralegals. You've got uh, every occupation covered through the spectrum. And, and, and here we are. And what, what's the one thing uniting us as a family? That Jesus has come to us, into our world, into our community, into our family, into our hearts. And that's enough, friends. And so when it, it comes to thinking about what, what does it look like for us as the church to seek the welfare of Summit County, of Breckenridge and Dillon and Frisco and Keystone, what, what do we have to offer that no one else has to offer? Well, there it is. The family of God. That's what we have to offer. We have to offer the grace of Jesus Christ. And that is so good friends. For a world that is lonely, for a county that is lonely, that is the companionship that, that goes deep. Goes to that heart level. Last week I invited you to take, a, take one of these commitment cards. Our Advent commitment cards. And, and there are three things on this commitment card. I'll get to that in a second. But So you've got a physical card, if you'd like it this way. If you'd rather, you can scan the QR code there or on, your, on the, uh, the worship handout, and you see second item down, Advent commitment card. Go there. Same thing, same form. And you can submit it that way. And there are three things that, we, that I am at. I'll, I'll just... There's no we. It's me. I'll take it for right or wrong. It's, it, it's me. And, and three things that we're asking 
you all to commit to this, this Advent and Christmas season? First of all, purposely saying no to something. You have to check this box. <laughs> something in here, right? In order to do anything else, you have to be able to say no to something so that you have space opened up in your life. So we threw out some ideas. You can read those for yourself. If you have another idea where you're like, you know what, I need to say no to that this Christmas season, put it in. And then purposely seeking companionship. This is where I personally have been challenged. <laughs> Who do I need to reach out to? Who do I need to ask to hang out, grab a beer? And there's all kinds of ideas there. That's good for me and for the other person, right? And then purposely sharing the presence of Christ with our community. More on that in a second. Invited you to put your name down know this, I'm the only one that's going to look at these. Whether you submit it, when we come forward for communion, there's going to be our offering box right here. That is a place where you can submit uh, the physical form, or if you submit it through uh, online form, it goes to my email. Only reason I want it is so I can pray for you and support you and encourage you. Caroling is one of the things listed for purposely sharing the presence of Christ this evening. Donna Lynn is leading a group down the street, down Colorado 9 here at, Col at, at Summit, uh, you know, Colorado 9 Summit Drive and, and, and Main Street. The Frisco sign. Right in front of the Frisco sign. 7 o'clock. Some of you may want to go and sing tonight with Donna Lynn and, and her crew. We'll love it. And John's going to take video, and it's going to be a beautiful thing, right? And we'll get to talk about it. That, that's one way. Uh, I know some of us have been talking about what does it look like to Carol in our neighborhood. What does it look like for you to purposefully share the presence of Christ this season? If you need to, I would prefer that you don't hand it, this in today and take it back home and pray over it if you need to think through this a little bit more still and then hand it in next week. But we as Christians are called as God's people to live a little differently this season. To live into the hope of Jesus. And this is where I hope that... Uh, we can be intentional about doing so. Amen.